ill and the snow plow this week just uh it, it's almost it's almost horizontal now uh kind of kind of parallel to the ground but uh his was ripped from off the stop wasn't it it was hanging down so i'm telling you i um I, don't, I think in, um, let's shift gears here just a second, I think in your bulletin there is a, an announcement uh, or in the prayer list of Kelly Spanier that passed away. Is that in there? That's in there, and I think it is. Um, I know none of you are going to know who this is, but I want to share with you just briefly, maybe uh, take two or three minutes to share with you the story of Kelly. Kelly uh, was my father's first cousin. He passed away this past uh, uh, Monday, I think it was. And uh, some of you may remember that about, uh, it'll be four years ago this coming July, my uncle Calvin Voss passed away. And uh, I did this, the funeral in North Carolina. And in that funeral, I uh, told the story of uh, Calvin and his, his wife Dorothy as they attended the church where I ministered in North Carolina and how his conversion took place. And I recounted all that in the service. Uh, after the service, uh, one of Calvin's older brothers, another one of my uncle, uh, spoke to me and he said, I'd, I'd like to talk to you. Uh, I'll give you a call in a couple of weeks. And so uh, he did. And, and in the course of our discussion, uh, what I had said about Calvin's conversion really touched my uncle Ralph. And he said, you know, I've never been immersed into Christ. I'd like to do that. And I said, well, great. And so we worked it out so that we went over in a, a couple of weeks and and uh, I had the privilege of baptizing him. Well, in, in the meantime, he had been talking with uh, uh, Kelly, uh, his, first, his first cousin then, because they had married sisters. And uh, so Kelly decided that uh, he wanted to be immersed as well. And I, I re- vividly remember the, uh, those days being able to, to go to the Rural Hall Church where I previously ministered and baptized both of them into Christ. And what a special day it was, and what a special home going now uh, for my cousin Kelly, and just a, just a great great story. So I, I tell that not not for any kind of you know personal family stuff, but to, to remind us all that in many ways the conversion of of individuals is all about the stories of our lives. If we share with the stories of our lives with the people who are closest to us, and what all those things mean. We'll do a much better job of, try, of reaching them for Jesus than if we try to argue them uh, into some kind of belief system. Uh, just uh, point that out to you. I also want to uh, tell you this morning that uh, if I'm a little slow in the pulpit, uh, I have a, a little injury that I uh, uh, did to myself this past Saturday. Not yesterday, but last, last Saturday. And so I won't be quite as nimble up here, so you'll forgive me for that, I trust. But uh, at any rate... Uh, uh, we want to continue in our sermon series uh, on Christian doctrine. And if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 26, we're going to talk about a, a topic this morning that uh, is a part of our fellowship every Lord's Day. Richard just was up here a few moments ago leading our hearts in um, a meditative moment relative to our observing the Lord's Supper. And so we're going to be talking about the Lord's Supper today. Uh, as uh, our topic of discussion, if you will. In Matthew chapter 26, uh, Jesus is, uh, is uh, meeting with his disciples as they observe the Passover meal. And uh, if you look in t- chapter 26 and begin with verse 26, you'll read these words. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and gave, th- gave thanks and broke it and gave it to the, his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. When I was in college, uh, we had one professor that uh, was probably the most well-known of all college professors uh, in the Christian church, uh, from Atlanta where I went. His name was Denver Sizemore, and uh, he wrote a book that many have used perhaps in study called 13 Lessons in Christ- Christian Doctrine and then followed that up with a book entitled Gems of uh, Christian Doctrine or Bible Doctrine rather. And uh, uh, Professor Sizemore was the only one of our faculty who was permitted to, to have a ministry uh, in addition to his teaching responsibilities. So he preached at the Central Christian Church in Atlanta and the church was integrated. 
and uh, which was really something back in the early 70s, obviously, but uh, it was an integrated church. And I remember on one occasion, he shared with us this idea. He said, you know that you've reached a certain level of genuine integration and acceptance between various races when people sit down and eat together. There is something about sharing a meal with someone that is that is just uh, uh, brings... Uh, a, a different kind of attitude and mindset to us relative to our Christian experience. We know that uh, uh, on one occasion, at least, uh, one of Jesus' disciples didn't fare too well with this whole idea of spending time eating with others. Paul tells the story in Galatians of uh, when uh, when Peter came and uh, uh, if you want to turn to that, you can read with me Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 and 14. Uh, Paul says, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. In other words, there was an uh, aura, uh, an attitude of acceptance that the apostle Peter had toward those of a different race. He said, when, you know, uh, before, uh, before these guys showed up uh, that came from Jerusalem, Peter used to he used to eat with anyone, including Gentiles. But after that, um, it, things changed. But when they came from James, he, or like I say, used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belong to the circumcision group. And Paul goes on to say, I address this hypocrisy in his life. Peter had once been willing to sit down and eat with Gentiles, but no longer. And so... Uh, uh, we look at this and we think, well, you know, that's, that's, is that really that big of a deal? Well, apparently so. Apparently the whole idea of being able to sit down and share a meal with someone was a really big deal. And I don't think it's any accident that Jesus chose uh, observing a meal as a way to unify his followers. I mean, we can disagree about a lot of, different, a lot of things. But one thing that can always bring Christians back together is meeting around this table. That's why it pained me some years ago when uh, many of you remember Ralph Sproles who came and spoke for our homecoming three or four years ago. Ralph preached at a church in, in another state at one time and he told me that, that uh, there in that church they had elders that stood around the table and prayed over the emblems who had not spoken to each other for 35 years. Now, uh, that just doesn't seem like that's the way it's supposed to be to me. I don't know about anyone else, but that looks like that's not what Jesus had in mind. If you look throughout the scripture, especially the gospels, in, in particular the gospels, you'll find a number of times when we could say that Jesus broke barriers around tables. He ate with people that uh, we would normally think of eating with and he partook food with, uh, you know, for everything from prostitutes to tax collectors and Jesus met people around a place to eat. And so I don't think it's any accident that he left us uh, one of the best ways of remembering him to do so around a table where a meal is observed. So let's answer a few questions this morning as we work our way through this uh, this idea uh, about uh, the, the Lord's Supper. First of all, how does the Bible introduce the subject of the Lord's Supper? Now, it just appears, if you will, uh, toward the end of his ministry, and uh, but it, that's not where it begins. It actually begins over in the Old Testament uh, when the uh, Jews observed the Passover feast. That that Passover feast was designed to help them remember the atonement that God had had uh, brought to them based on His relationship with them. But then in the Last Supper. Jesus eats this Passover with his disciples. We have it recorded for us in Matthew 26, in Mark 14, in Luke 22, and again in John 13. All the the gospel writers include this particular story from the life of Jesus. And I don't think that's any accident either because of the significance and the importance of this supper. When you look at the Bible then... What do we? What kind of names do we place on this particular uh, uh, practice? Well, there's two or three that the Scripture gives. The one is referred to in the Scripture as the breaking of bread. In Acts chapter two, verse forty-two, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Then in Acts chapter twenty, verse seven, it says on the first day of the week we came together to break bread. We also have the, the name of this uh, observance referred to as the table of the Lord. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21, we read these words as Paul was kind of admonishing the Corinthians. And he says of them, you cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. In other words, you're, we are already coveted, uh, coveted with uh, Jesus Christ. And so we can't join ourselves to anything or any other idol relative to this kind of practice. And so Paul says, you can't drink of the cup of the, of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot have part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. And so we refer to it sometimes as the Lord's table. Because he instituted it. He, he's placed it here. And then sometimes we have it referred to as the Lord's Supper. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20, the Apostle Paul, in a very sarcastic tone, was talking about how the Corinthians were trying to do this, uh, do this thing called the Lord's Supper, and, and they were messing it all up. And that's why he wrote the words that Richard read this morning, and I'm going to read several more times before the sermon's over. That's why he... Uh, he says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty, when you come to, together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Now, what he, he doesn't mean that it, it wasn't the Lord's Supper that was prepared. He meant that the way they were doing it, the, the way that they were, were kind of prostituting themselves to their own desires, it turned out not to be the Lord's Supper at all. It was someone else's supper. It was the supper of selfishness, if you will. So what does the Bible teach us then about the significance of this Lord's Supper? Well, it teaches us that it is, in fact, an ordinance. Now, an ordinance is a command. It is instruction. It is a rule or guideline. In Luke chapter 22, verse 19, it says, speaking of Jesus, and he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this. Do this. An ordinance, a command. Do this. But not just any kind of ordinance command. Do this in remembrance of me. Now we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. 1 Corinthians 11.24. Paul repeating those words. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, as much as a command or an ordinance it is to meet around the Lord's table, consider this. To view the Lord's Supper... As only a command minimizes the thanksgiving and joy that should be present while we partake. Uh, Most of us see laws and rules all the time that we have to obey, and we're not real happy about it. I'm not. I don't know if you're. If I'm in a hurry and I'm going down the road and I see a sign that says 55 and I want to go faster, I'm not happy about that sign. Any of you feel that way? Or you just go ahead and not think about how happy you are and just go ahead and we're in 65 or 70 or whatever, you know. So most of us aren't real happy about commands. And unfortunately, sometimes that's a real downer when it comes to our relationship with Christ because there are lots of ordinances, lots of commands that the Lord has given, not because he's trying to restrict us, but because he's trying to help us enjoy the circumstance as much as possible. And so to view meeting around this table as a command only will minimize the thanksgiving that we should have in our hearts as we come to this table. So we should observe it. We should celebrate. It's a celebration. Now, I know that we're supposed to be focused on the death of Jesus, and that's a somber moment, but but I don't know about you, but aren't you happy even in those moments that Jesus died for you? I certainly am. So it's an ordinance. It is also a a memorial or a covenant. 1 Corinthians 11.24 again says... When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance. Remembrance. It is a sacrament. That word sacrament refers to soldiers pledging commitment to commanding officers. And so when we meet around this table, it is symbolic of our pledging ourselves to him. Participation in the the body and blood of Jesus carries with it an inherent rededication. Now, most of us in here today, we're here most every Sunday, and we do this most every Sunday, and we would say of ourselves, well, you know, I I said yes to the Lord a long time ago, and I don't have to worry about saying yes to him anymore. No. But most, most of us, I would venture to say that when we're partaking, we're thinking, you know, Lord, help me do better this week than I did last week. I'm recommitting myself, I'm rededicating myself even now as I observe this meal that you put before me because I know how important it is and I want to rededicate myself to your service. Um, 
But to view the Lord's Supper only as memorial minimizes the aspect of a living Savior. So if we, if we think about this table only as something that uh, we do as a memory, we forget that there's life tomorrow, the Lord willing, and the day after, and next week, and next month, and all that. So we have a living Savior that's walking with us through this whole process. And if we think of it only in terms of a, of a, uh, a memorial, we'll always be focused on the past and not focused on the future. Now, a few weeks ago, when we preached the Sermon on Baptism, I um, actually, I guess it was, maybe it was far back as the end of November. I think that's right. I introduced you to, if you didn't know this guy, I introduced you to a fellow by the name of Ulrich Zwingli. Zwingli lived in the 1500s, and he completely rethought the idea of baptism, saying it was not a, an ordinance or a command of Christ or a command of the early church, but rather was, in, in fact, a covenant, that you did it because you wanted to be in covenant with the Lord. Now, it's true that we do that. But Zwingli did the same thing with the Lord's Supper. He viewed it not so much as an ordinance, but as a, as a memorial or a covenant that we're entering into. And so in, in, with these two ideas, Zwingli changed the prevailing understanding of both baptism and the Lord's Supper for about the next 400 to 500 years. One guy. In 1 Corinthians 11.25 says, In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. It is, in fact, the Bible is, in, I mean, excuse me, the Lord's Supper is, in fact, a covenantal meal. It renewed our participation because we accept the promises of it and we also accept the responsibilities that go with it. Um, it would be a great shame, I think, if when we meet together on the Lord's Day, we go through this process of observing the Lord's Supper in kind of a, a disconnected or even mindless way, thinking, okay, here, here comes the medicine for this week. That's not what was intended. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. In other words, we're commissioned to discern the body. And I think uh, the scholars have debated long, long, long time about what is meant by that term body in this text. Is he talking about the actual physical body of Jesus? Or is he talking about the, the body, which is the, the, the fellowship, the membership of the church? And I don't know that anyone's ever come to a, a real satisfactory answer to that. So I have a tendency to think that maybe Paul was using that word as it could concern both when we eat, we think about the body of Jesus as it hung on Calvary, but we also consider those who are sitting around us and those who have participated in every communion service or Lord's Supper service from the beginning of the, when it was instituted and, and those who will do it years after we're gone. And so just in some general thoughts, let me share with you this morning these things. The Lord's Supper is worship and edification and fellowship. The Lord's Supper is a connection with the church, both universal and historical. The Lord's Supper is a matter of, of remembrance for my recalling, if you will. It is a celebration to, of freedom which believers enjoy as a result of, of and a response to God's actions. And to set a table was a sign of friendship and commitment. We talked about that earlier. And how much more so is it when we partake of this particular table? Paul wrote to the, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six: 26, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so it is a, it is a time of, of forgiveness that is offered and a forgiveness that is accepted. It embraces the presence of Christ because we meet Jesus' death both at the Lord's Supper and in baptism. Those are the only places the Bible tells us that we meet the death of the Lord is in, in, the, in the Lord's Supper's uh, observance and in baptism. And it also has something, as I, meant, as I alluded to earlier, that it does that, that nothing else does, I don't, I'm not, I don't think. And that is it brings the unity of the body. When you put Two people together and you absorb the Lord, uh, observe the Lord's Supper, those people are united. When you put 10 or when you put 100 or you put, when you put 10,000, 
It brings a unity that nothing else does. So what does the Bible teach about how to observe the Lord's Supper then? Well, we know what the elements are. The bread and the, and the cup or a wine, or the, a wine mixed with water was used in the early days. Today we use grape juice or whatever. The occasion of observing it is on the Lord's day. And the frequency is as often as, as possible, as often as we have the opportunity. There are people that uh, think if it's not done Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a real problem. You know, there are other people, you can't do it any other time but then. And then there are other people who think, well, you know, as often as possible. In fact, Josephus, the great uh, he, uh, Jewish historian, wrote about the early Christians that as near as he could figure, they were a group of people that met every morning, every morning about sunrise and observed a meaningless meal. But the scripture implies that we do this weekly. Acts chapter 20, verse 7, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. That's, that's an implication there. But I, I've shared this with you before, what, what I'm about to share, but I want to share it again this morning because I think it, it fits here. It's, it, it's a great description of how the early church viewed the Lord's Supper. Now, when I say the early church, I'm not talking about the church of the, of the Bible. I'm talking about the church in the next century. Justin Martyr was a, uh, was a great Christian who in the, in the mid part of the, of the second century, but he lived between 100 and 165 AD, and he wrote extensively about the various doctrines of the church, and he wrote this about the Lord's Supper. Listen to what he says. Speaking of, the, of a service, speaking of a, of, a, uh, of a church service, if you will, he says, then, a bread, then bread and a cup of water mixed with wine are brought to the president, the leader, if you will, of the brethren, and he taking them, sends up praise and glory to the Father of the universe through the name of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and offers thanksgiving at some length that we have been deemed worthy to receive these things from him. Does that sound anything like uh, uh, communion meditation? That's basically what we're talking about here and a prayer. When the president has given thanks and the whole congregation has assented, those whom we call deacons give to each of those present a portion of the consecrated bread and wine and, and water, and they take it to the absent. Does that sound like what we were doing pretty consistently before COVID? Okay. Um, this food we call Eucharist. That word uh, is used in a lot of churches to denote the Lord's Supper, and it means blessed or sacred gift. Blessed gift. This food we call Eucharist, of which... No one is allowed to partake except the one who believes that the things we teach are true and has received the washing for forgiveness of sins and for rebirth and who lives as Christ handed down to us. For we do not receive these things as common bread and common drink. Now we might look at it and say, this is just a little piece of bread and this is just a little cup of juice. He says, we don't look at these things as common But as Jesus Christ, our Savior, being incarnate by God's word, took flesh and blood for our salvation, so also we have been taught that the food consecrated by the word of prayer, food consecrated by the word of prayer, which comes from him, from which which our flesh and blood are nourished by transformation, is the blood and uh, uh, flesh and the blood of the incarnate Jesus. For the apostles in their memoirs composed by them, which are called gospels, thus hounded down what was commanded them, that Jesus, taking bread and having given thanks, said, Do this for my memorial, this is my body. And likewise, taking the cup and giving thanks, he said, This is my blood, and gave it to them alone. On the day called Sunday, there is a meeting in one place of those who live in the cities or the country, And as said before, when we have finished the prayer, bread is brought and wine and water, and the president similarly sends up prayers and thanksgivings to the best of his ability, and the congregation assents, saying the amen. The distribution and reception of the consecrated elements by each one takes place, and they are sent to those who are absent by the deacons. Now, I don't know about you, but if there was ever a clearer description of what it is we try to do within the Christian church and the church of Christ relative to the understanding of the Lord's Supper, this best describes it. Relative to that observance, John Calvin, the great theologian, said, at least once every week the table of the Lord ought to be spread before each congregation of Christians 
And that custom which enjoins believers to communicate only once a year is unquestionably an invention of the devil. Whoever were those persons by whom it was introduced. John Calvin, who we would not agree with on many things, we certainly understood his words on that. It's a great attitude that we're to approach this, this memorial, this ordinance with. I want to read those verses again, and then we're going to close here in just a second. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning with verse 24. And when he, speaking of Jesus, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself. I want to pause right there and just say this. If one doesn't have the ability to examine himself spiritually, then probably doesn't need to be meeting around this table, which would exclude a number of folks, unfortunately. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. If you were looking at these verses and trying to draw some kind of parallel, or there's, there's four things I think that leap out at me. There's remembrance, there's expectation, that is Jesus coming, there's proclamation, that he will be coming, and there is examination of ourselves. And since it is not a man-made meal, even though we put the emblems out, it's not, it's, we didn't come up with it. We can't invite or forbid participation in it. For only Christ can set the conditions of that participation. Three times a month, Jermaine Washington and Michelle Stevens get together for what they call a gratitude lunch. With good reason. Washington donated a kidney to Stevens, whom he described as just a friend. They met at work where they used to have lunch together. And one day, Michelle wept as she spoke about waiting on a kidney donor list for 11 months. She was being sustained by kidney dialysis, but chronic, suffered chronic fatigue and blackouts and was plagued by joint pain. Because Washington couldn't stand the thought of watching his friend die, he gave her one of his kidneys. When you've got something great to be thankful for, Having a gratitude lunch, having a gratitude lunch is a great way to celebrate. And I don't know of anything that is any grander that the church does on a continuing basis than to meet around this table each and every Lord's Day. When you got something worth celebrating, it's a pretty big deal, isn't it? And we get that opportunity every Lord's Day to do that remembering the sacrifice that he's made for us, as well as remembering the body of believers to whom we are connected because of that body and blood. If you're here today and you haven't ever responded to the love, grace, and mercy of Christ, and this, is, this idea is just something foreign to you, which I doubt that's true of any of us in here today, but we'll make concessions that perhaps that's the case. Or maybe we haven't thought about it as much as, as we ought to relative to just picking up a little piece of bread and taking a little cup of juice and thinking, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've done this today. There's a whole lot going on here, folks. A whole lot going on here. And this is what God has called us to so that we can be reminded of who we are and to whom we belong. But if you have a need today that you need to make public, we're going to sing a hymn of decision. We're going to ask you to stand now. And if you have a decision to make, we encourage you to do that today. We just come as we stand and sing.